Thank you very much for the opportunity to present at this conference. I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, today I'm going to be speaking to you about hydrometeorological events and early warning systems for vector-borne diseases with a focus on dengue. So our work focuses on developing early warning systems driven by climate information. And the goal is to try and shift from a, uh, a framework where we're relying purely on surveillance information to uh, make predictions about disease, which leaves us with very little time to intervene. So if we wait for a big epidemic to happen before we take action, then it's likely to have very little impact in reducing um, disease risk. There are some countries like uh, Brazil and parts of Europe that have strong surveillance systems and can rely on uh, reporting of early cases as a sort of precursor to see that an epidemic is about to happen. But we want to understand the links between environmental conditions and disease outbreaks. And there's often some natural lead time that can be gained between uh, anomalous climate conditions, for example, particularly warm or wet conditions, the time that that takes to impact uh, mosquito distributions, for the mosquitoes to infect a person and that person to report in a hospital. But we would like to extend that lead time even further by using uh, forecasts of the climate, which in certain parts of the globe are particularly effective. For example, in the tropics and subtropical regions, we have areas where we are able to predict with some accuracy uh, climate conditions for the forthcoming months. So I'm going to present to you uh, some work that we've developed uh, using Bayesian statistical modelling to produce probabilistic forecasts uh, for disease risk. And I'm going to show you some case studies uh, for Brazil, Ecuador and Barbados. So my uh, work in climate uh, information linked to disease risk started during my PhD when I was working on an interdisciplinary project uh, looking to see how we could use seasonal climate forecasts for application areas including public health, agriculture and hydropower management. And I was involved in uh, the working group looking at health impacts with the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation in Brazil. And so we were working with the climate services there and we developed a modelling framework for climate sensitive diseases where we were looking at variation in climate conditions uh, also accounting for socio-economical conditions and trying to link these to the risk of dengue across Brazil. So we developed this model uh, framework trying to integrate uh, the decision-making procedures of the Ministry of Health and in 2014 we had the opportunity to put our research into practice because the Ministry of Health asked if we could apply our model to produce a uh, dengue outlook ahead of the World Cup in Brazil. So we managed to uh, put together all our resources, combine uh, climate forecasts issued several months in advance to make a, a prediction that was published in the Lancet Infectious Diseases before the Games took place. And then after the event, uh, we were able to access the data that was actually observed and perform an evaluation of our forecast. So unfortunately the colours are not very clear in this uh, graph. but. The map here um, shows the probability of certain categories, uh, risk categories for dengue. So if you look in the publication, you'll be able to see the actual colours, but uh, strong uh, saturated colours show a high certainty um, of a particular category. So the red colours show um, the probability of observing high risk of dengue, which is defined as exceeding 300 cases per 100,000 inhabitants, and uh, the blue colours show probability of low uh, dengue risk, which is less than 100 cases per 100,000 inhabitants. And these uh, category boundaries are used by the Brazilian Ministry of Health in their epidemiological bulletins. So areas um, where th there's which, which the paler colours indicate that the model was not sure which direction the forecast would go, and I can assure you that our colours were not as pale as shown in this map. And we combined uh, the seasonal climate forecasts that were, were issued um, in February for precipitation and temperature across Brazil with the surveillance data for dengue that was available at the time of the forecast. This information is very uncertain. It hasn't been corrected or reporting delays, but it was the best information we had available to us at the time. And this gave us a three-month lead time for our, our dengue uh, forecast. 
And then after the event, we wanted to see how well our model did predict the category that was actually observed. So the map here um, on the left shows uh, the probability of observing the correct, correct category overall. And then we've broken this down into the different risk categories. So for example, we can see in the low risk, uh, the gray areas on the maps just show uh, the appearance of the other two categories. So we can see that the model uh, successfully predicted a high probability of low risk in areas, for example, in the south region of uh, Brazil, where the climate is uh, too cool for dengue. So the model, because it takes into account uh, the climatic conditions and the population situation, it knows that cool places or remotely uh, or remote areas, for example, in the Amazon, uh, are not likely to have a high risk of dengue. Uh, we also uh, can see in the high risk uh, map that there were pockets of the northeast of Brazil where the model was able to detect um, a high probability of the high risk which was observed. Okay, so I'm now going to shift over to our work in Ecuador. Uh, Ecuador is, a, is an area which is particularly sensitive to the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Uh, when we see uh, warming of the Pacific Ocean, uh, which is otherwise known as uh, an El Nino event, uh, we can see extreme climate conditions in different parts of the globe. And southern coastal Ecuador is a, an area which is particularly sensitive. And this map here shows the correlation between sea surface temperatures in the Pacific and rainfall conditions. And we can see a very strong positive relationship. And this map here is showing the province of El Oro, uh, which where our colleagues are doing a lot of research um, on the ground to understand uh, the dengue situation. We can see in this uh, image here the aftermath of some of the most extreme flooding that was experienced in uh, the city of Machala, which is the capital of El Oro. Um, this flooding was the worst event that the air has experienced since the extreme uh, El Nino event in 1998. And as you can imagine, uh, created ideal conditions for the transmission of dengue. So what we did, we, ha we collected the uh, dengue um, surveillance data that was available from 2002 and to 2015. And we compared this to the climatic uh, conditions in the area for the same period. And we could see some general patterns. For example, the cooler and drier um, years were associated with less dengue, while the warmer and wetter years were associated with more dengue. And these warmer and wetter periods tend to be linked to the El Nino events. And we wanted to make a prediction for the 2006 season, uh, just following after um, the second most major El Nino event experienced uh, in recent years. So these uh, graphs here are showing us, um, these are seasonal climate forecasts. So this is an ensemble um, of predictions for precipitation and temperature in the area. And seasonal climate forecasts aren't always reliable, but thanks to the uh, the warming of the, uh, the ocean, this gave the, the global climate models uh, some predictability and the models were able to predict this extreme precipitation event that happened in February which coincided with the flooding event uh, and also that it also predicted uh, the higher temperatures earlier in the year. So we incorporated these ensemble climate forecasts into our Bayesian prediction model and we tried to make a dengue forecast. So here we're looking at the, uh, the mean and the 95% uh, confidence interval of the dengue data uh, for the previous five years before 2016. So this is the kind of information that decision makers usually have to base their um, decisions. They, they just look to the past, so we're just looking at the average of the past five years to see what we can expect for, for the next year. So in uh, the Ministry of Health in Ecuador would be, have been expecting a peak in dengue to occur in June of 2016. And then using our climate-driven forecast, our model predicted a earlier peak uh, around March 2016, just following um, the sort of warm and, and uh, very wet um, events, with a high probability of exceeding the 95% upper confidence interval for the previous five years. There are some credible intervals there, but I'm not sure if you can see them. And then after the event, we compared this with the observations, and you can see that the, the, an early peak did, in fact, occur. 
and the, being able to predict the timing of this peak was thanks to the climate information. And we also had access to um, some serosorological data um, for uh, Machala, where the dengue, uh, reported dengue cases were, were tested uh, to see if any of them were actually other febrile in illnesses. And it turned out that uh, chikungunya had been um, introduced to the region previously. And in 2015, around 70% of the reported dengue cases were, in fact, chikungunya. So we were able to correct our, um, our dengue uh, case data uh, in, for 2015, which helped improve the magnitude of our forecast and also the benchmark estimates. So we were fortunate to be able to combine climate information with serological studies, active surveillance data to improve uh, the forecasting and, and surveillance in the, in the area. Okay, I'm now going to move on to our, our project uh, looking at the risk of arboviruses, in particular dengue and Barbados. So a team of... Um, uh, some members of our team were sp spent some time earlier this year in Barbados conducting some stakeholder engagement surveys and the, it was observed that the dengue seasonality seemed to have changed recently and it wasn't necessarily following the wet events and they'd observed some dengue outbreaks uh, following dry periods. So we wanted to investigate uh, this relationship. So we had a look at the uh, dengue data available since uh, 1999 for the um, island of Barbados and we compared this to the standardised precipitation index which is an index which tells us uh, if we're going to see extreme uh, rainfall or drought conditions and this ranges from around uh, 2.5 to minus 2.5 with positive values indicating extreme rainfall and negative values uh, drought conditions. <coughs> And we can see here the brown areas in the middle uh, plot show us the, the dry conditions which tend to coincide with extreme El Nino events which are shown here. And we wanted to see uh, what the relationship was between droughts, uh, rainfall and temperature. So to look at this we combined distributed lag nonlinear models within our Bayesian hierarchical framework to explore these relationships. Okay, so this here shows us the, the relative risk of dengue, uh, taking into account seasonality, uh, long-term trends, uh, related to the um, standardised precipitation index. So we can see here at short, um, shorter lags between, say, zero to one months, we have an increased risk uh, during exceptionally wet conditions and warmer conditions, but we also saw this, um, this increase in relative risk following drought periods at longer lags. So I'm now just going to show you, this is just a, a slice of those um, heat maps we saw. So we can see increasing risk uh, for dry conditions at longer lags, uh, which is, is something that, it, this something which we were pleased that we could incorporate into the models, because often in previous attempts, we've just been selecting the best lag or looking at the short lags and not really taking into consideration what might be happening in the lead up to an, to an epidemic. So this indicates to us that a combination of dry conditions followed by extremely wet and warm conditions could provide optimum conditions for a dengue outbreak. And we think that might be related to the way that people are storing water. Uh, Barbados brought, recently brought in some uh, legislation to encourage uh, buildings to have water storage containers to try and confront the drought issue in the water scarce areas but when these conditions when these containers aren't well maintained then they provide excellent uh, breeding uh, sites as we heard uh, this morning. Okay so then we wanted to combine this um, delayed and non-linear climate information into a, our prediction model and we wanted to see how well our model could uh, predict ep ep uh, outbreaks. So we looked at the probability of exceeding out an outbreak threshold, which is just defined as the 75th percentile of the historic distribution. But these are out of sample predictions, excluding the year that we're trying to predict. So here we want to see uh, strong colours um, where we have the crosses. So a cross shows that an epidemic was actually observed and the shading shows the probability of the, uh, of the threshold being exceeded. 
So we can see that our model did uh, quite well in some years, for example in um, 2007, uh, 2010 and 2013. It didn't do very well in the last year, it, was, uh, it missed uh, the epidemic and we think this is due to the complication of having the circulation of other arboviruses. Uh, chikungunya was introduced um, in 2013 into the Caribbean. Uh, Zika was introduced in 2015 to 16. And so we're looking to see how we can try and understand why our model did not predict this dengue outbreak and whether these other arboviruses may have uh, played a role. So we wanted to compare our model to a, a baseline model just based on the current practice. So looking, including um, the annual cycle, if you like, and we saw that our model produced uh, more successful predictions and less false alarms than this sort of current practice model. So this is all very well, but how can we transition from this theoretical framework to something operational that could be used uh, to, for mosquito-transmitted um, disease early warning systems? So we saw from my previous examples, this is just uh, issuing a, uh, for a set target three months in advance, um, a spatial map. So this is using, uh, working towards a set target because we had a specific goal in mind. This uh, was predicting the entire season, making use of the multi-lead uh, climate forecast. In this case, we didn't uh, include the surveillance data as well because we can, you, that doesn't give you much predictive uh, lead time. And now with the Caribbean Institu Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology, we're looking to combine their seasonal climate forecast of the standardised precipitation index and minimum temperature in, in our model. So our model relies on the climate information from zero to five months uh, in the past. And the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology uh, tend to issue their uh, drought forecast with, uh, starting with a three month lead time. So if we are looking at a target of October, in July, three months in advance, we can take the observed uh, climatic data that we have from May and June, combine this with a seasonal climate forecast available in July, leading up to our target, and then each month we can update this forecast, bringing in some new observations of the climate and updated seasonal climate forecasts. So what did we find? We found that drought periods followed by warm and wet conditions might cause uh, ideal conditions for dengue outbreaks and that our model did a reasonable job at distinguishing between outbreak and non-outbreak years apart from the last year that may have been complicated by the introduction of uh, the other um, similar arboviruses. And this is p important particularly for small island developing, st developing states like Barbados and other islands in the Caribbean where climate change is contributing to more intense and frequent droughts and hurricanes. And we are working with our collaborators there to try and extend this framework and develop a region-wide early warning system for Aedes-borne diseases. And the goal is to try and incorporate this information into the Caribbean Health Climatic Bulletin, which is, uh, was launched last year and has been issued on a quarterly basis. At the moment, it just includes um, qualitative information on the seasonal climate forecasts and what they might expect for health. And we're hoping to be able to um, in, provide some probabilistic forecasts for which decision makers can base their, their decisions for um, vector control interventions. So I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Uh, this is a picture of the team in uh, Caribbean. I'm extremely grateful to all my uh, collaborators on this work. And if you want to learn more about our recent publication, you can find it in PLOSMED. Thank you very much.